And so we keep evolving. And so I think it's so important to remind everyone that um, wherever they are, it's always important to keep reevaluating your definition of success. Does this really hold true for me today? What if the key to true success is giving ourselves permission to break free from conventional molds and embrace our unique identity? Welcome to Seek Go Create, where today we're joined by Gene Tien, creator of the Success Method and a beacon for those seeking to redefine success on their own terms. From the structured path of an Ivy League education and corporate career to a journey of self-discovery and empowerment, Gene's story is a testament to the true transformative power of authenticity. She's here to share how breaking free from traditional expectations can lead to a more fulfilling and impactful life. Gene, welcome to Seat Go Create. Hi, Tim. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and to have this conversation. I'm glad for you, too. You're, what you talk about is such a great match for us here at Seat Go Create, Redefining Success. And so let me dive in. My first question, when people ask you what you do, what do you tell them? I am a corporate nine to fiver on the path to redefining what it means to be a successful uh, professional. And so what I mean by that, if I may, is that currently I still have my nine to five job. Um, It's what keeps me going. And at the same time, I'm using all of the experiences that I've gained in corporate to look for the gaps, the opportunities to be able to support others as they're looking for their way in terms of redefining success as well. And by creating the programs that I've created, by working with the individuals I've created, it's just to shift the whole paradigm of what it means to have that job. So what are some of the struggles that we can have? And this is a it's sort of a jokey question, but hey, someone's got a good job. What more? What more would they want? You know, <laughs> um, I, you know, I think everybody has their own struggles, and it's funny. I was just coming out of coffee with a friend of mine, and we were just having this conversation where she thinks that nobody else is having similar problems, and I told her she's right. Nobody else is having similar problems because we all have our unique set of problems. But I think overall, the same struggle happens for all of us, which is we're looking for our place on this planet, where we fit in, where we can really not just fit in, but where we belong and how we get that sense of belonging. And I think when you're in that corporate nine to five, I think many of us have worked really hard to get to where we are today, only to realize that it's not where we wanted to be in the first place. It's not what we thought it would be. And then we've worked so hard. We've invested so much time and energy and resources. Now the question is, okay, I feel stuck. And it's that sense of stuckness that keeps people, I want to say, in the same place because they're either afraid of taking the step forward. They're afraid of pivoting. Our favorite word from COVID is pivoting. Uh, They're afraid of making the wrong decision or somehow ruining all of the hard work that they've done. And I could say that none of that is a reality. All of that is fear-based and it's most likely, it's most likely what we're all dealing with in some shape or form manifesting itself in some way or another. I'm kind of with you that, that word pivot. I think we're starting to overuse it now. Of course we do that. We all, I was doing an interview the other day and I used the word unpack and I hated myself. I'm going, darn, I said, I'm, you know, a few years ago, it's like everything, we're going to unpack, unpack, we're going to unpack. And now I, I think pivot, but I, I do think it's a good word for the topic. I can't think, I was at a Bible study with a group of people, business owners, entrepreneurs the other day, and we, we were using the word transition, mm. which is pivot. <laughs> it's the same thing. But Gene, the, I remember... It's been 30 plus years. I'm dating myself a little bit. I remember a term that I heard a lot that was something to the effect of, I may butcher this, but I'm going I'm to mention it and you could let us know how it ties in, where people would say they've been climbing the corporate ladder only to find out that the ladder is leaned up against the wrong structure or 
whatever. Is, is that part of this? Is that statement still hold true today? I think it still holds true. And I think it holds true for many of us. Um, I think most of us climb the corporate ladder because we were told that's what we're supposed to do. We were told that's what being a good citizen is, right? Like, the higher you climb, the better that you are. And we do what we're told. And then when we get to towards the top of the ladder, I think many of us start to look up at that point because we can, right? Because we're trying to enjoy the successes that we've achieved. And then we realize that, oh, wait, where? And I think so many of us ask this question is like, okay, now where am I? And so that's the question that then people aren't really sure how to answer. And so that's where I come in. Or, or a lot of people, <laughs> this is going to sound cynical, but the audience is going to be okay with it because they know that every once in a while, Tim goes full on cynical. Or, it's okay. Are we in a culture where people are just disgruntled and unhappy and there's in some ways not a lot that we can do to make some people happy? I think that's such a good question because what it brings to mind is yes, but no. I think that there are potentially disgruntled and unhappy because they're not willing to settle anymore or they're just not necessarily comfortable with where they are. But then the question that comes to mind is how did they get here? And then so to say that we're in a situation that they're just disgruntled and unhappy suggests that there's no path out or that there's no solution out. And I definitely think that there is a path out. And I think so many of us suffer unnecessarily. One of the things that's interesting, I love what you said there, is as I interact with a lot of people as an executive coach and I get to talk to people with what I do here and in ministry and things like that, I recognize that in the world there's a lot of what I call hope, hopelessness, you know, lack of yeah. hope. And hope's a weird word because it sounds a little frou-frou, but yet I think we all need to have a certain degree of hope. Hope, yes. hope that we can improve, do better, hope that we're not going to show up at work and somebody's going to fuss at us and yell at us. And so one of the most interesting things when I do, when I do research on people, I shared this right before we click record. The reason I was so attracted to what you do, and sometimes I don't remind myself of this until a couple of days before the actual conversation. Like, I think we booked this way back when I'm like, going, yes. now I remember why I'm talking to Gene. <laughs> okay because of the success method. And we'll talk about that in just a moment and things yes. like that. But what I was really reminded of, Gene, I went to your website and I listened to, it looked like a TED talk, but I guess you were speaking in front of a group, like a five minute thing. Mm -hmm. And it was basically you talking about walking in the door your first day of work. Now, for yeah. those that are listening, they can't see it, but behind you, there are some degrees on the wall. Yes. And you've I mentioned it in the intro, you've been through Ivy League. You appear to have done all the right things. Yeah. What caused the issue when you walked in the door and like right out of the gate, it seemed like things went the wrong direction for you. Oh, yeah. In your first go. <laughs> Sh share whatever that you'd like, because I think it's really helpful for people to know how you redefine success early on in your career. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, like you said, I literally did everything by the book. I studied really hard. I got the good grades. I got into the Ivy League University, graduated, and I got a job in finance because that's what all my friends were doing. That's what we were supposed to do to make the money. Um, and then the day that I walked into the door of my first job, which I really, I was told once when I was complaining or venting, it's a nicer word to use, when I was venting to a coworker. <laughs> you know, how I'm not happy at work. And I remember very specifically, he's like, there are so many people who would kill to have your job right now. And it's not like I was a top investment banker or anything. I just had a position in a really good place of employment with a top brand name. But I remember going into that job and I really wanted to do my best. And so I put so much pressure on myself to do it. And what I realized was like, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea like what I was even supposed to do. And I just remember getting yelled at by my boss often. <laughs> 
And like the snarkiness and the comments and no matter what I did, it just never felt like it was enough. And then I couldn't ask the right questions. I couldn't even do the right things. And whenever I tried to do anything extra, I wasn't even getting at like brownie points or anything. I would just still be left to the side. And so it was like time after time. And it was just like, you know what? I'm so sick of doing what I'm supposed to do and not getting anywhere and getting beat up like over and over again because I'm trying to make everybody happy. But it was at my expense. And then so there was just that moment of forget this. I am not doing this. And I, I can't because I'm doing it according to what everybody tells me I should do. And it's still not getting me anywhere where I need to go. So let me just try to do this my way. Let me do what I think is the right way. And of course, we have to do it within the parameters of the environment that we're in. So let me try my way. Let me try not to worry about what others are saying. Let me just go forward and have no regrets. Because if this time it doesn't work, then at least I could say I have no regrets. And it, it was interesting enough when I started to do that, my career just shifted entirely, like entirely. And then so then people started coming to me and I started becoming the subject matter expert, which honestly built my career and my confidence. And it's still what I do today in terms of how I operate at work. So, gosh, there's like three questions floating through my head. Let me start <laughs> with this one. Guessing you didn't change your actions as much as your mindset shifted. Would that be a correct assumption? And talk more about it if that, whichever direction. Yeah. So, I think it would be hard to say that I. So I think they're very much linked in my personal experience. I think they're linked, right? So if I couldn't change my mindset, then I think my actions would have repeated itself. I think in terms of what I didn't change was what I knew. I knew what I knew, but what I changed in terms of mindset was to stop giving everybody else credence and to start giving myself credence, right? To start crediting myself with what I knew and stepping into that. And from that perspective, that mindset shift actually shifted the actions that I took. Quite frankly, I stopped kissing everybody's butt and I stopped trying to please everybody because I knew I recognized if they don't understand what I'm saying, I can't really do much other than to try to help them to understand what I'm saying. But I'm no longer going to say, oh, my gosh, you're so right. And like and put myself behind it. Um, but I would have to give myself a chance, right? Not mute myself, not do all the things that put me second and everybody else first, especially when I knew within me that they didn't really know what they were talking about, right? Like that they were wrong, quite frankly, if I want to be honest. And this was a process too. I think in the video that I watched, I think you went through three, four or five positions as you- Oh, yes. So it wasn't like two weeks in, you figured this out and it's like, oh, Jean's good. Now she's on her way. It was a process, yeah. correct? Oh my gosh. It was a very long and extended process. It took multiple jobs, like shifting. You know, I think so many of us go from one job to another, hoping that our problems would go away, right? Oh, I hate my manager. He's such a jerk. Okay, let me go find another job. But guess what? Your next job, your managers or somebody else is going to be such a jerk too. And so you're going to have the same problem. And then so when I started to recognize that, I'm like, oh, wait, you can't really run away from your problems. <laughs> as much as we like to think that, like, it's the other person's fault, what I've honestly realized over time is that it's really us and how we see things and our perspectives. And when we get mad at something, it's not necessarily the other person. Yeah, the other person can be a jerk. They can be a backstabber. They can be many things. But how we react to it, it's all on us, right? Whether or not we can tolerate it, how we respond to it, it's all within us. And so we can either get um, stuck with it or if we shift the way that we see things, we can start to turn it around and turn the situation around. And quite frankly, once we start to do that, that's when others come to us. That's when others start to trust us because... They know that they can have this rapport with us and still get to a place of common good is what I'll call it. Jean, did you feel this is, this is actually the beginning of a question and I'm, I've got a couple of questions to follow up. 
Did okay. you feel, and I'm looking at the diplomas behind you here, did you feel somewhat entitled to a certain path or a certain level of respect or honor? I don't even know what kind of words we could use oh, here. Yeah. Because of oh, the yeah. hard work you had done that you would step in and all would be great. So was entitlement part of it? I think there's a level of entitlement that comes with it. And it's an entitlement that I I don't I don't want to overlook it, but I will say I think we're fed it, right? Oh, we're fed this story that if you go to a good university and you do all the work you're supposed to and you behave the way you're supposed to, then when you enter the workplace, you'll get X, Y, and Z. And when you don't get X, Y, and Z, you're just like, wait, what? I was supposed to get X, Y, and Z. People were supposed to respect me right? Because I came from here and I have this and I meet the qualifications that they asked for. So they would respect me, right? And at the end of the day, th that has nothing to do with it. You earn people's respect through the work that you do, through your interactions that you have. And it's never really about, and this is something that, you know, as a mom too, because my teenager, not my teenager, my son is turning to be a teenager next year. This is something that we struggle with, I think, even more now than we did in the past in the sense that your degree, your piece of paper, your resume never guarantees you success. It never guarantees you to work with professionals only. We work in an environment where there's so much diversity in the backgrounds of everyone that's around us that if we don't know how to handle ourselves, we'll never know how to work with the others around us as well. And I love the general message is all about looking at ourselves because what I what I heard you say was basically you had all your degrees and all that kind of stuff. And that got you to the starting line that got you to the place to start. I was reminded of a weird story. I'm going to share this. And then, and then I think it opens up the door for us to discuss more. Years ago, I was having my hair cut with a friend and she was standing there with scissors in her hand, cutting my hair, looking in the mirror. And she commented, my wife and I just celebrated an anniversary. And her comment was, I really do wish I had a marriage like you and my wife, Glory. And she was at the time, and I'm not judging this, this is an observation. She was on her third husband and, and she was complaining about each one of them. Okay. And, and I should not have said this with someone who's standing there with scissors in her hand. And she was looking in the mirror. And usually when she cut hair, she looked in the mirror at herself. She didn't look at me, which gives you a little clue okay. as to her. And I made the statement. I said, maybe it's not them. Maybe it's you. Mm. Which is a pretty harsh statement. And again, she's standing there with scissors in her hand and my hair is about half cut. But I think the, the reality of it is I'm hearing you say, Maybe it's not, I think the manager that you first used, you called him Bob in the video I watched. Maybe it's not the five Bobs that you worked for that were all jerks. Maybe it's Gene. So how do we start, if you're saying it's us, how do we start looking at how we adjust instead of blaming, I don't blaming whatever, being a victim. We could use a lot of words, but yeah. how do we start that process to realize, first yeah. off, they're listening in here. That's probably one of the starts, but how do they start? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I call them Bob. And the reason I call them Bob is because what it represents is a block of beliefs. And so it's all about our beliefs and our beliefs filter our reality, right? Our beliefs are the way that we perceive what we're going through. And, and by no means am I saying that Bob was faultless and that Bob is perfect. I think if you had a certain problem with Bob, then 10 other people probably have the same problem with Bob. Now the problem, now not the problem, but the reality of the matter is that all 10 people won't have the same reaction to Bob. So why is it that you have this reaction to Bob? Why did, was it that I had this reaction to Bob where I let Bob impact my emotions every day, where I went home crying, where I literally gave myself insomnia because of all the stress and anxiety that I put on myself, thinking that it was Bob who put this on me, right? And so I think that's a great question in terms of how do we start identifying 
why this is bothering us so much or why Bob is bothering us so much, I think it's really asking ourselves the questions that we're too afraid to ask ourselves. And if Bob did something really mean, then for lack of a better word, we'll say mean because it's very broad umbrella, then why are we so mad? Like, why are we so mad that Bob did this? Right? And okay, so Bob shouldn't have done it. Agreed. But then why did this generate this level or trigger this level of reaction within us? What is it bringing up? And a lot of the times it's something to do with our own fears, our own past experience, what we think it means. A lot of times it's a disrespect type of thing, I think, amongst all of us. If I was respected, Bob wouldn't do that. And maybe not. I don't know. Bob is Bob, right? We don't know. But when we feel disrespected, when we're afraid that this means we're going to get fired or whatever the situation is, it generates this reaction. And then so when we start to look at where this trigger comes from, what had triggered this type of reaction, what our main fears are or what the beliefs are on this thing, then we can really start to dissect it. And then we can start to determine, okay, does one plus one always equal two? right? So in the past, let's say um, I'll use my childhood. If I did something wrong, I always got in trouble and the punishment usually wasn't very enjoyable. <laughs> I'll put it like that, right? And though, oh, well, if I make a mistake and Bob gets really mad, does that mean that the punishment won't be that enjoyable, will be the same level of pain or hurt or frustration or sadness? And it's usually no, because we're not at the same place anymore. But in recognizing this and in seeing this, we can then start to take it apart and say, it's, is it really true for us today or is it something different now? And then if it's something different, how can we overcome the beliefs that we have, the experiences that we have to start to respond differently to the same type of triggers that we have, which is always going to be in a form of Bob somewhere. And the other thing that I think many of us forget is that Bob could be going through the same process himself. Oh, yes. He may not want to be where he's at. He may think that he deserves some different role. And then, you know, we bring in this, I hate to bring up the word, not really diversity, but it could be that if both of us work for Bob and I'm a guy and Bob's a guy and we go out yeah. to lunch once a week, you're sitting there going, I don't go out to lunch once a week, Bob. They must be buddies. We may not be buddies. We may just, whatever, go out to lunch. I don't know. But so there's a lot of things that factor in. Yeah. And what I'm hearing, Gene, and I think this is what I picked up on, and maybe I think this is a good place to go with the conversation, is that really we have to kind of own this. We, we, it's not like we can offload this or get even AI to help us with it, which is <laughs> interesting buzzword or anything like that. Now we, we really have to come to terms with owning that and taking charge control, whatever word, there's probably a lot yes. of words we could use. Yeah. And, and is that correct? And, and yes. And what does that look like? What did it look like for you as you came along? Yeah. So for me, it was really, oh, Yes, absolutely. We have to own it. Otherwise, Bob owns us. And so it's either we're going to take control of the situation or as much control as we can of the situation. Or somebody else is going to control our emotions, our beliefs, our reactions. And in terms of how it looked like for me, it was just to a point where like I was so uncomfortable, I sought help. So for your clients, they seek you out for help. And I sought out a coach for help. And it was, re it was really beneficial because my coach was able to share with me and to shed light on the areas that I never knew didn't need to happen. So, for example, I always thought, oh, if you mess up, then oh, you have to be scared because you're going to get in trouble. And then so, like, my coach showed me, like, no, you don't have to be scared. We're all human and you can make a mistake. And oh, this is how you go forward and move it and for and move forward with it. But that's not what I was taught. I was taught I had to be perfect. I was taught that anything outside of perfection meant that we were going to fail and that I, I should fix it right away. And so having that third party perspective is super, super helpful. Now, we can't always afford a third party to help us. But if there's somebody that we can 
trust to be able to be honest with us. It's definitely worth having that conversation, but also recognize the fact, and I think this is where so many people go wrong too, is that, and I was actually just telling my friend this too, is that we can, we should only listen to the advice that resonates with us. Because as much as you and I are coaches and for however many years we've done this, we still have our own filters in place that may not necessarily be relevant or accessible to the person that we're talking to. And so getting an outside perspective is helpful. But at the end of the day, it's really taking in the information that really resonates. And does it always work and clear out the problem? Maybe, maybe not. But I think it's I think something we have to get comfortable with, too, is not a one and done process. It's an evolution. It's a journey. It's trial and error. And so maybe we thought, sorry, my dog is on the side. I don't know if you hear her, but maybe we thought that this would work today. But um, if it didn't, maybe it wasn't meant to. Maybe we have to look at it something else. Maybe there was something missing that we weren't comfortable accepting or looking at in the first place. Yeah, we'll welcome the dog in on the show here. What's the dog's name? Just so we can give proper credit. Sure. Her name is Oreo and she's a puppy. We just got her. <laughs> and if you can hear, I apologize. I gave her treats. I thought she was going to calm down. <laughs> she's like going wild. <laughs> we will just welcome everybody kind of knows that I broadcast my section from an RV and we could have blowers and noises and stuff like that. So we'll welcome Oreo. And maybe we'll ask a few questions of Oreo shortly, or maybe we won't. Okay. We'll Thanks, Tim. Gene, something that's, that, gosh, this comes up a lot, and I, and, I, and I wish it didn't, but I think it's appropriate. When we talk about these things, we also have to bring in things like culture, gender, uh, you know, structure, uh, you know, what part of the world we're in, there are all these different things have to be factored in. And the reason that I want to do that is because I think you work primarily with females. Is that correct? Yes. For the most part, I work primarily with females. Yes. Okay. So then this is a question that I seem to ask a lot when I have someone like you on, is it, what are, and here's the reason why, let me preface this. Many times when we're talking about similar topics with, say, a male, we're not having the discussion about you need to take charge. You need to be in control of the situation. And I must admit, I am sitting here listening going, yeah, 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 I get that. But I also think back to my nine years, right when I came out of Georgia Tech and went into corporate, I, I was probably a Bob. I probably walked in thinking that I owned the place. I'm not saying that's good either, but I don't think I thought about some of those things. Let's talk a little bit, as much as I hate to go here, let's talk a little bit about either cultural and or just the differences. And I don't like to group people, but we're about to do it. So what are some of the unique challenges related to those differences? So let me know if this answers your question, Tim. I think, and happy to just be honest and full disclosure, I'm not easily offended. So feel free to say whatever. It's totally okay. Yeah, that's what benefits everybody else, right? To have an open and honest conversation. I think there are differences because that's what, that's what makes us unique are the differences, are our lived experiences. And you and I don't have the same lived experience. I am an Asian female and I'm 46 years old. There are other Asian females who are 46 years old, similar, or maybe same diploma or whatever it is. They, this person and I won't have the same experiences, right? Because we never grew up with the same people or whatever. Even my brother and myself don't have the same experiences because he had a different life than I did, even though we lived under the same roof. And so these are the differences that create and contribute to the experiences that we have, the experiences that feed into our beliefs and our reactions and our triggers and everything else. And so the way that we see things will be different. I think I want to say I think most of us walk into a new job, especially graduating from an MBA program or from you know, a university, thinking something is going to happen and that we deserve to be there. And absolutely, we all deserve to be there. I, I think 
when our expectations and the reality don't match, I think that's where it's like, oh, wait, that's like a big sign of, okay, wait, what happened? And I think some of us are able to adapt and be more resilient to it and others are not necessarily going to be. And for me, I fell into that second part. I fell into that latter category of not being resilient because I didn't know how to handle differences. I didn't know how to have conflict, conflict-free conflict, if that makes sense, right? Because I wasn't taught that. Whereas if you were to walk in, you probably knew how to do it and because you were taught that. So everybody will be different. And I think that's what create, um, that's what creates the interesting situations that we have, whether it's at work or at home, outside, et cetera. I, and I think the thing that's tough, it's, it's tough for me, but I want to be better. And I think it's tough for everybody at various levels is that we know the value of diversity. It's just pulling it off to get everybody underneath one roof is really, really hard. Oh, yes, it is. It's great. Theoretically, I think when you execute it in reality, people don't realize how hard it is to actually make it work the way that we think it should work. And then so that's where we fail because it's in the nuances that creates quite frankly, the experiences that we have, um, whether it's good or it's bad. And so if we can handle the nuance when it comes to that diversity aspect, it it really does benefit the overall organization. So somewhere along the way, you you continued in the corporate path, but then you started on the side, side gig, side hustle, yeah. another company, whatever. Yeah. Tell me about the formation of that and then we'll probably start moving into some of the things we could learn from all the things you've been teaching and sharing in that environment. Yeah, absolutely. And so for me, you know, it's interesting because when I started to see how much easier things can be when we started to shift the perspective, I realized like there's so many of us that are suffering unnecessarily. They're suffering in silence, but it's also so unnecessary, right? And like all of this, we do mostly to ourselves. I want to like 80 to 90% of it we do to ourselves. And when I started to realize that, and I felt like I was the biggest quote unquote self designated victim out there. And if I could see that change and if I could make this leap, then so many of us could do it too. And we would have better working environments for everybody, like everybody. And so that's when I recognized, I was like, I can change that. I can actually have influence in that. And by sharing my experiences, by working with others to help them see maybe where they're holding themselves back the same way that I was doing to myself. And so that's how I started um, working with my clients and sharing the messages that I have out there as well. So when did, give me a time frame. when was that and where was that yeah. in your career trajectory? Yeah. So I want to say it was about five years ago. And it was, it, was a, it was before COVID, but when COVID came, it really gave me an opportunity to devote more time to it because I didn't have to commute two hours a day and I can really be a little bit more flexible, yeah, in terms of the time that I'm committing and how I spend it. And I think in terms of where I was in my career, it's so interesting because I was doing well in my career. And yet I wasn't doing well in my career. And that's when I started to see, okay, so if I make the mindset shift and stop trying to please everyone, I can do better. But then I'm, if I'm going up in the ladder, aren't I supposed to be happy? Aren't I supposed to like want to go to work? Aren't I supposed to feel joy for more than 24 hours after I get promoted? Because isn't that what we're all like supposed to be working for, right? And yet like I couldn't make myself feel joyful for the promotion to like middle management or whatever for more than 24 hours, no matter how I'm like, oh, you should be grateful. Well, not everybody gets this. You get more money. And so why are you so unhappy? You're broken. Like those were all the thoughts that basically came to my head. And I was like, wait, something is just not right. And so that's when, you know, I started talking to others. That's when I hired my coach. And they're just like, it's not you, but it's you, <laughs> essentially. It's like, this is all you. 
And that's when I realized that we can have all of the successes, and I put that in quotes, right, on the outside, but if we're not getting any of it on the inside, it doesn't matter how much money we have. It doesn't matter how high in the corporate ladder you ha- you are. It doesn't matter like what car you drive or what house you have. Or, And quite frankly, I hate to say this because I know I'll probably get some slack for it from parents, but it doesn't matter how many kids you have, right? Even though you love your kids, it doesn't matter how many kids you have if you can't be present with them, if you can't find the joy of having all of the things that you have in your life. And that's why um, that's where I was in my career when I started. One of the things, and you just did a great job of almost defining our redefining success mantra that we have here. You went through all of it. And I guess kind of as a follow-up, I wanted to ask, why is money not a good gauge of success? Oh, wow. Where do I start with that? Money is just money. And I know that sounds terrible. And I know some people will say, well, that's probably because you have some of it. And you could say that. And yes, there's absolutely some truth to that where, you know, I'm not on on homeless on no, the side of the street. And I, and I do have some because I work, etc. But money can go away at any time, at any, at any day. And I can have my job today or I can't have my job today. And I think the biggest example of that was the financial crisis in 2008, where people who had worked for 50, 60 years on the verge of retirement lost everything and they had to start all over again. So does that mean that they were unsuccessful because of that situation? Or do we need to reevaluate what we're basing our success on? And I think what happens with money is that we start to define ourselves based off of how much is in our bank account. And if that's what it is, then you don't need to have a family. You don't need to have anything, right? Like you don't need to have any experiences. You just go to work, collect your paycheck, and the bigger it grows, then does that mean that you have more value? And if that's the case, then okay, that's great because some people, they're fine with that. But then others will ask, then what value have I contributed to the overall society? What value have I contributed to my community, to the world today? How have I made people's lives better? And those are the people that I tend to work with because they want more in life. And it's not saying that they won't have more money by pursuing more. It's just saying that money in and of itself is just a piece of paper for them that helps them. It's like a means to the end that they're seeking. Yeah. And I, I, the thing that I found, because that story of 2008 is our story, multiple, okay. multiple companies, big house, all that kind of stuff. And I found myself attaching my identity to that success. And so when all of a sudden that shifted, changed, went away, blew up, whatever terms you want to use, I started questioning, okay, maybe I wasn't as smart, as good, or whatever. And so that's, and, and that becomes tough. I, I, I love that you're pointing people more toward an inner. I think a lot of people will tie faith in. We don't shy away from that here. For me, it was quite a faith journey, but somewhere along the way you developed this method that's, I call it success, but there's a period after each one of the words. And so I don't yeah. know if it's S period, U period, the success method. Tell us about that. And then maybe in the time we have, maybe we can unpack. Did you see I I worked that word in? I made (laughs) it work. Wow. We can unpack that a little bit for for some folks so that they can take some tangible things away from here. So success method. Tell us about it. Absolutely. So it is an acronym as we love all good acronyms. It is an acronym. And so I don't, there's seven steps to it because one step for each letter I won't go through all of it, but I think some of the more important ones is the first one for S, right? And that's really important because this is where I see most people fail. And it's the one that is so critical that most of my clients spend the most time here, which is it stands for sussing out your definition of success. And most, actually all of my clients, when I've asked them like, okay, what do you, you know, define your success? They've never sat down to define their success. They define it in a way that they think they're supposed to. Oh, I, I want to make whatever. I want to have this. I want to have that. Okay. But what's your definition of success? 
And why is that important to you? And so when we can, and the reason it's so important is because this is the analogy that I use. If you get into your car and you know you need to go somewhere, but you don't have a, defi- a, a destination to enter, then how do you know where to go, right? You don't, you're going to be driving around aimlessly, hoping to one day be placed in the right situation. And you just spend so much energy and gas and money trying to figure it all out and you get hopeless and lost along the way. And so it's always important to have that destination. So it keeps us on the path of where we want to go. And then it becomes so much easier to filter out all the things that are unimportant to us. So that's the first step. And that's the S. Good. All right. So I want to, I do agree because it's one of the reasons this show exists. That is probably the most challenging for people. Probably always has been, probably always will be. And, and I'll, I'm going to spout a few reasons why I think it might be, and you could just respond and come back and maybe we could get Oreo to jump in. I hear Oreo a little bit there. Oreo can jump in and give some thoughts as a puppy that's probably chomping down on some kind of toy or some treats. Yeah, that's you can success. hear it. <laughs> that's a, that's a, is it a he, a he puppy? She. She. Yeah, she, her, her success so, yeah. is, I got it and mom's not taking it away from me. <laughs> exactly. I've got the treat and the toy and we're in good shape. So the thing that I noticed, let me kind of share this. We were, I was, we have a grown son. We have two grown children, but we, our grown son and my wife and I, we were in Las Vegas recently. And we're sitting in Las Vegas, and I just kind of shared this over lunch. I said, you know, I think I like the thought of Las Vegas more than I like the actual being here in Las Vegas. And it got us on a great deep conversation of thinking we should enjoy something, thinking that culture likes this or that or whatever. Now we've got all these, what we call social media, where we can compare to people. I think very few people take the time to do what you're saying, which is define what their success is. So I'll just pause and let you respond or say some things about maybe other challenges or those challenges that you see with people doing it. Yeah, I absolutely agree. We think we would enjoy something more than what is actually true for us. Because that's what we're told, right? Oh, whatever stays in Vegas, whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, which is gives that implicit message like it's going to be fun and it's going to be exciting and uh, like you, whatever happens, it's going to be memorable and you're going to want to talk about it. That's brilliant marketing, right? Why wouldn't I want to go to a place like that? And then when you get there, you're like, oh, it's kind of dirty and it's not that like exciting and it's not really my thing anymore. But then I think this is where people start to look the other way because then they're like, wait, but is it me? Because they told me that ooh, whatever stays in Vegas, whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So am I the weird one that's not enjoying myself? And it's like, no, there's like a million other people that don't enjoy Vegas. And you're not the odd one. You just happen to know, you know, what you like. But knowing what you like and accepting that you like something different from the majority or what you're told or you're supposed to, that's the hard part. And I think that's where success goes wrong, right? Because, uh, you know, and, and I see this all the time. It's like, oh, I want a big house. Wait, but why do I want a big house? What does it mean to me? Oh, I want to drive the German cars and the luxury cars. They're fun. Okay, but then what about the maintenance and this and that? And you know, what about all those? We forget that sometimes... We don't have the same likes or uh, preferences that most of our other peers have. And we don't want to climb this corporate ladder and that's okay, right? And so because we want to do something different. And I think the younger generation, I will say, as much as like they get the crap, the younger generation is much more accepting of the fact that they don't want to follow the footsteps. Whereas... I think my generation and above, we're just like, wait, but aren't we supposed to? Isn't that what makes us like acceptable? And doesn't that what makes us fit in? And if we go back to the original 
part of this conversation, it was like, we're all looking for our place in this world. And then, and it's really hard and it's really lonely. Yeah, and I'm sure you feel this too, because you're a coach. And so when we see things that other people don't see, and you're trying to find that community, it's really hard and it's really lonely sometimes. And people just don't want to, you know, they, they don't want to deal with it. And so it, it discourages them from looking for other definitions of success and for allowing for their truth to be recognized and honored and accepted by themselves because, it, you know, it could be a little uncomfortable. I think for the most part, we are all created for something unique, to do something unique and specific in this world. But it seems like many people will copy and be yes. copycats. And do yeah. other things because it's tough to be different. Again, part of the catalyst yeah. for what we're doing here is, and you're talking, you know, you're preaching to the choir here. <laughs> My wife and I live in an RV and travel. We are, you mentioned being homeless earlier. I'm sitting here going, we're homeless. We don't have a home. <laughs> now we right. do. We have a motor coach and yes, we're down here in Arizona. The weather's nice. You're in New York. It's cold. I'm in a pretty good spot right now. But, but part of that is you have other people that ask often, what are y'all doing? When are y'all going to settle down? What, when are you going to place to go? They, and sometimes I think people think it's, they think it might be judging their choices. I don't think it is. I think when people walk their own path and then other times it's just, they just don't understand. Yeah. And, and I, I think there takes a certain degree of courage to begin this process. Talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Cause I think that's what I picked up from you from the video I watched is that it took you a little while to all of a sudden have that, you know, the Wizard of Oz, you were given courage all of a sudden. And it takes courage to go through this, to ask for help, to go get a coach or to sit down and say, I'm going to work on this definition of success. Yeah, it definitely takes courage. It's so uncomfortable at times. And especially during the times where you're at the precipice of growth because growth means you're getting uncomfortable because you're not you're growing out of your comfort zone. That's what growth is. Um, so it absolutely takes courage. And what's more about it, too, and this is this is one thing that I am going through right now. So we're having a very good conversation now in terms of timeliness is that. I think we all want to control the circumstances. We all want to have safety. And we think that by controlling our circumstances, we are safe. Whereas I think so many things around us have shown us that there is no ability to control. Any of us have no ability to control our circumstances. The only thing we can control is how we respond to a situation. And, but the thing is that it's scary when you go out there and you follow an unconventional path. And it doesn't even have to be that unconventional. You don't have to quit everything and then move whatever. Like, it doesn't have to be that unconventional. But even something as simple as saying, okay, I'm going to accept the fact that I don't want to work a nine to five. I want to pursue a hobby or I don't care about the promotion. I want to spend the extra time instead of working. I want to be able to spend the time knitting because that's what I love to do and trusting that it's going to be okay at the end, right? Something so small as that or seemingly small as that can take a lot of courage because, you know, you're doing something that other people think you're crazy for doing. Oh, why wouldn't you want a promotion? Why don't you want more money? Why don't you want da 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 da, da right? And it's like, no, because I put my personal joy ahead of all these things. But few people value that sense of personal joy because we all work towards that pot at the end of the rainbow. And it's so funny because when have you ever seen a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, right? So what you can only see now is what you have in front of you. And, but we're taught to ignore that because we want, we want to prolong our ability to enjoy the riches that we have because that's what makes us a good person or so we're told. So we're told. Yeah. So if someone is sitting here going, you know what, I got, I've got to work on this, defining what success looks like for me. And I know, listen, both you and I would say, get a coach. Maybe that doesn't make sense for everyone, but what are a couple just like quick tips? And then I do want us to do maybe a quick run through the rest of the system without going into a lot of detail, 
But I think, sure. I think I agree with you. This is like the most important. So a couple quick things for somebody who's listening going, I need to define my success better. What are some things yeah. that they can do tangible that can get that process started or more clarity there? Yeah, I think we start with the easiest part, right? So I think what we start with is what does like what is your current metrics of success? And I think so many of us will say the money, the whatever, whatever. And it's fine. There's absolutely no judgment in any of that. But write it all down. So let's say you write your top five metrics of success. So when I first started, it would be where I am in my career, how much money I have, whether or not I'm married, whether or not I have kids. Those are, quite frankly, all cultural things, right? And let's just keep it at that four. Now, if I go, and then now the second step is to go back to each one of these metrics and say, what is it about this metric that makes me successful? And then it's to really be that personal um, investigator, right? And really dig deep into it. Okay, money makes me successful because if I have money, then I can buy all these different things. And okay, so I can have an island and I can have all of these things, but does that truly make me successful? Well, because everybody has, I take that back. Most of your audience, most of the people we know have money in the bank. So does that make us successful? And I think if we look back 10 years ago, oh, I wanted this amount in the bank. And I'm pretty sure most of us probably met or exceeded that amount. So are we successful? Is that where we stop now? And then so it's just to keep looking at the circumstances and say, okay, you know what? Maybe it's not the money. Maybe it's what money represents, right? Oh, I want the ability to make, to have freedom. I want the ability to make my own decisions. That's great. That's what success is. It's not the money. It's what that represents. And a big house, is it really the house size? Because I can think of a million reasons why a big house isn't successful. Like I would have to clean it, right? And then so it's, is it just a place to live? Is it to be comfortable? Is it a place to like entertain your friends? And then, okay, so what is it that you're really looking for with that as well, right? Or is it just what society tells you that you have to do? And so if you go through each one of these metrics, I think you'll become clearer on what your definition of success is. And one thing I want to caveat here too is that definitions of success evolves. It's never static. And so, and I think we learn that, right? If you look back at your kids or at ourselves when we were younger, it's to get an A in this test or get a, you know, whatever it is, right? And so we keep evolving. And so I think it's so important to remind everyone that, um, Wherever they are, it's always important to keep reevaluating your definition of success. Does this really hold true for me today? And there's no judgment on it if you look back and say, oh, I can't believe I used that. Yeah, but that's what was important to you at that point. So what is important to you today and how do we go forward and achieve it? Yeah, that's part of the journey we're on. We've got just a few minutes here. Tell us what you'd like to about the U-C-C-E-S-S. Either, yeah. either the which one, what they are, if you want to hit a high point or two, and then uh, we'll let people know how they can connect with you and, and get some more info and all if they need to. Absolutely. So I think as you're going through this process, the U is to underline um, the successes that you've already achieved. And then the C is to create new success goals. And I think as you're going through this process, what you realize is that your goals are bigger than anything you've ever been allowed to dream of before or to even imagine that you can achieve. And so it's super important to go through this process to understand where the fears that are coming from, to really investigate them as well. It's a lot of self-investigation, right? Like a personal detective to look through and then really to, it's about the energy that you stay in. And I think that it's most important to find what's most important to us because when we do that, it's like natural fuel is what I call it because you're never going to want to give up because there is a value to it that you see that keeps you moving forward. And yeah, that's that. I think those are the main points of the success method. Yeah, that's very good. Tell us, Gene, you've got a lot of stuff. You've got podcast, you've got, you speak, you coach, you've got this system. Tell us what you want to about where people can connect with you, where they could go 
And, uh, and then I've got one more question before we wrap up and finish. Yeah, absolutely. So they can find me on my website. It's jeantian.com. And I'm also active on Instagram and it's at jeanftian. So I think those are the two main places that I would direct people to if they want to learn more. Perfect. And tell us all that you have available that you really do that you like to pour into people with this process and this method. Yeah. So they, there's a book called Your Success Blueprint where I walk through basically the entire success process. And then um, there's also, if you want just a quick listen, not to take time away from Tim's amazing podcast, but I also have one too. And it's called Being Unapologetically Authentic, where we really just also start to take the the scariness away from looking at success in a different way, similar to your goal here, Tim. And yeah, I think those are two really good places to start. There was a good, and here's what a lot of people may love because we're 60 minutes usually long. I went and listened to a couple of seven minute podcast episodes of yours yesterday. And one was something that we talk a lot about here, which is kind of the anti hustle and grind culture. And, and that's a great fit. I do think go subscribe and join up over there and listen in, listen in over there. Gene, we are seek, go create those three words. I'm gonna let you choose one of those words. If you need to consult with Oreo and y'all come up with a team answer, that's fine. (laughs) But seek, go, or create, which one of those words resonates more than the other and why? Yeah, I think Oreo would agree. Seeking is most important and it should be of no surprise after what we just talked about as well. I think seeking our truth is really, truly the first step that we can all take to create the success that we all have been working so hard for. Excellent. Gene, this has really almost been a master class of what we started this podcast for, of redefining success. I think that what you discussed and what you're doing is so aligned with what we're doing here at Seek Go Create. And I appreciate that. So I highly recommend everyone, and thank you for the conversation. I highly recommend anyone, anyone, if you've listened in, jump over to being unapologetic with, is that being unapologetic? Uh, It's being unapologetically authentic. Unapologetically (laughs) authentic. Yes. With Jean Tian. Go check that out and subscribe there and look at the success method. Go to her website and follow her. I think that'd be a great match for what we're doing here. We are Seek, Go, Create. We have new episodes every Monday. Until next time, continue being all that you were created to be.